Since the dawn of civilization, water has defined where people live, when they thrive, and when they move. I'm J. Carl Ganter, and this is Speaking of Water from Circle of Blue. Water doesn't le necessarily lead to conflict. In fact, it more frequently leads to cooperation unless societies don't have the institutions to negotiate with each other. It's time for them to move. And I don't say that in a heartless way. I say that in a humanitarian way. So, you know, it is time to move. Today's a special episode. We've brought together two authors, Giulio Boccoletti and Parag Khanna, to interview each other about their new books that are capturing attention around the world and provoking debate about borders, conflict, and what sustainability may look like for the human race. Let's start with water right off the bat with Giulio. And, you know, you went really deep into history for water. I think deeper than, the, sorry, puns always included. Um, and for water biography. And you really, you know, really follow the pathway backwards and with some sights forwards. But being a water guy, I'm really curious, what are the two or three things that surprised you most when you were writing this book and in water's role in shaping civilization? Well, uh, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, several things. I mean, partly the book is a bit of an exercise in an archaeology of ideas. And the uh, intent was to reveal the DNA of the relationship between society and water as it is expressed in the institutions of society today. So you go look at the legal system or you look at our uh, institutions of government and you ask yourself, well, where did this relationship with the landscape uh, relationship with geography, which in a sense is what also Parag has been thinking about for many years. Uh, wh where does that actually show up and how obvious is it? And one of the surprising things that I think I, I realized as I was digging back is that, uh, you, you know, the symptoms of that relationship are almost invisible to us today. Uh, but they were obvious to people all the way up to the, the early 19th century. I mean, it's, we live in a very unusual time in which we don't have a real relationship with our landscape and with the geography and the nature of the geography around us. Um, and so, you know, when you start looking back, it doesn't take a lot to unearth the relationship between water and uh, and society in the way it influences the legal system in which, in the ways in which it influences, it, uh, you know, political systems, simply because, you know, controlling water on the landscape is an exercise in power. And uh, power is intermediated by institutions and society. And so, and so it was sort of as simple as that in a way. So that was one thing that was surprising. The other thing that was surprising, um, which, again, I think also in, in Parag's work sort of arises in a way, is that historically there's been extraordinary diversity in the way in which societies have dealt with uh, creating institutions to tackle some of these kind of landscape issues. And we live in a very peculiar time when whether you're in Singapore, in London, in Japan, or in California, your environment kind of looks all the same. And that's sort of an accident. It's, a, it's an anomaly in the history of, uh, of humanity, uh, one that makes us blind to the diversity that we live in, and also one that makes us blind to the diversity of solutions that you might be able to bring to wrestling with some of these um, environmental and, and governance uh, issues. So those are a couple of things that were, you know, were surprising to me, just how easy it was to reveal that relationship. and, and you know, the, the degree to which diversity actually exists in the solutions that humanity has developed to solve some of these issues. Great. Well, um, thanks, Julio. And the same, same really question for you, Parag. Um, you love maps um, and in, uh, in working on, uh, on MOVE. You know, what were the really two or three things that caught you by surprise the most? And, and maybe even come back to a, a touch on water and some of the, the resource drivers that we're facing today. Absolutely. Well, I, by the way, I wanted to say it just occurred to me that I bet Julia and I both knew exactly what the titles of our books would be before they were written. <laughs> just that one word that you know captures everything you want to say. It's obviously far more concrete, let's say, uh, you know, with water. Uh, move is slightly more, uh, you know, ethereal uh, concept, but still that one word we needed to build everything around as a kind of scaffolding. So I did want to go back also to sort of, you know, ancient times, so the really to the very beginning, to the first human steps out of Africa and explore uh, mobility, not just anatomically, it wound up becoming, you know, a meta study in a way of all forms of mobility. And of course, it's often reduced to just migration, but fundamentally it's about human geography, the distribution of human beings around the world. How did we get to where we are? 
over the last 100,000 years and where are we going over the next merely 10, 20, 30 years is going to contain enough dynamism that one doesn't have to look much further than that. Um, and so that's, I wanted to kind of focus on what will be, what will be different in human mobility in the coming decades and what will be the distribution of the 8 billion, 9 billion people on the planet in the year 2050 and reverse engineer over the next 30 years. How did we get there? Where are we? Why are we there? Um, and so forth. And of course, water plays an enormous role uh, in that story. It always has and it always will. Um, the technological solutions that we can conjure up to water shortages and water crises are insufficient to the scale of the problem that we have in terms of our demographics, right? So it's one thing to identify, you know, desalination or atmospheric water generation. And I, I go into all of those technologies, but we are still dealing with, again, the human geography issue. And so in a way, of course, water explains to a large degree our human geography right now, but it also therefore explains what our future human geography is, uh, given the the uh, the ways the way in which water resources have been misused, exploited, um, and in 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 many cases eviscerated. Um, and so that kind of scramble, if you will, for water is going to shape that future human geography and our present migrations. And one sees it in the news of course, every single day. So in that sense, there's a deep, deep uh, intersection, you know, and I just want to say one last thing, which is that, you know, the demographics and the geography, that's really what this is about. And our demographics, actually, we right now we're at a moment where the world population is reaching a plateau much sooner than anyone expected. There really won't be, I really d doubt, and I'm happy to debate this, uh, you know, ad nauseum with uh, other, with, with experts. But I actually don't think the world population will cross 9 billion people. I really don't. Uh, we've been so massively wrong on this issue the last 20 years. Remember, 20 years ago, the forecast was 15 billion people. Today, the, for the forecast before the pandemic was 10-ish. And if you have been following the news, the baby bust from the pandemic is so severe uh, that it will massively reduce fertility, already has. So, our problem is a distribution problem. There are only going to be 9 billion people that will live at the same time on the earth. And we have 150 million square kilometers of territory. Much of that is habitable, you know, livable for human beings. Much of it has ample water resources. And as a political geographer, many ways, I ask myself this question, how will our borders, how will our norms, how will our institutions adapt to cope with that distribution problem, that misalignment? of the geography of water and natural resources and the cr current geography of people. Because I am actually very interested in a uh, kind of challenge that I faced in writing my own book, which Parag, I suspect you've, um, you've had to navigate in the process of writing not just this book, but all the books that you've written around the power of, of geography, and is the kind of issue of teasing out sort of the dialectic relationship between the agency of society and the environment that uh, people live in without falling into sort of naive determinism, which is often the, the criticism that books like ours sort of get, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the issue that people get accused of sort of engaging in, right? Because I don't think your argument, and certainly not my argument, is that the environment uh, uniquely defines the trajectory of humanity. And in fact, you engage in scenario planning all the time. But right. in the dialogue with the uh, environment, we end up generating a constrained set of choices, and it's in, it's amongst those that we end up choosing. So I wonder if you if you if you could reflect on that tension between revealing the role of the environment and the role of geography as a determinant, whilst at the same time not falling prey to sort of you know traditional nineteenth century sort of uh, you know Kellen and the likes sort of you know geographical determinism. Right. I love it when people cite Kellen. <laughs> it brings me back about 25 years to geopolitics class in college. That's um, right. But that's actually a brilliant question. And I do use complexity as an approach, right? So in complexity, you push the system and the system pushes back, right? And so in a way, that's the way in which I, I navigate 
the relationship, the dynamic between human society, civilization, and the environment. It isn't that one can master the other or one is fully beholden to the other. And of course, that is very consistent with uh, particularly 20th century history with our rapid technological evolution. And of course, it's going to be, a, you know, a, a, you know, technologies, the ones I mentioned earlier and many others will play a role in us trying to tame uh, nature. But at the same time, fundamentally, you know, there, there are two caveats. One is as mammals, we are imbued with a certain fight or flight instinct. Right. So there does come a point where you don't fight nature, you flee. Right. So that's that's part of it. So that's not determinism, but it's saying, OK, we lost this round. Let us find another geography to conquer and to prevail upon. The other caveat would be the water caveat, which is, again, we obviously can't survive without it. Uh, and within the water issue, water stress, you know, too much water or too little water. I'd be very curious to ask you this. Um, you know, I, this may be very, very blithe, but, um, you know, too much water is a quote unquote is less of a less severe problem than too little water. Right. I mean, if you think about the floods in Germany or anywhere for that matter, people can move upland. Right? They can they can simply relocate. They can uh, they can cleanse that water. They can use that water, harness that water and so forth. But you can relocate. But you're still near water. But just today, if you saw, you know, one of the headlines uh, about the um, uh, the Wajia region of uh, Kenya, you know, where they're saying that the drought is so severe that they will <coughs> die. And I, I look at a situation like that and I say, you know, the next rain, even if it comes, is nothing but a very temporary salve. Um, it's time for them to move. And I don't say that in a heartless way. I say that in a humanitarian way. So, you know, it is time to huh. move. So I'm curious, you know, uh, Julio, from what, what you've seen, you know, when you look at the geography of water and the geography of people, you know, it's kind of uh, you know, this misalignment of geographies. Does it kind of tug at you? Do you say, you know, people should be able to live and have the right to live in places that are abundant in water, provided, of course, that we do so in a sustainable way? Well, it's a great question. And um you know, I think there's there's a there's less asymmetry than than I think you're implying, in my view at least, uh, in the question of more, too much water, too little water. The, the, there are three sort of interesting geographical distributions. One is the, the sheer distribution of demography and where people live. The second is indeed the distribution of water. And if you took that, uh, you know, at face value, you could sort of map the gaps and say, well, people, you know, live here, there's not enough water, therefore they might move over there. But there's a third distribution, which is really important, which is the distribution of uh, collective power, which is, dis you know, which is essentially effective through the institutions of the state in, in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, and that's where you end up with a situation where Dubai exists, right? So you have the Emirates carrying capacity of circa 20,000 people, but 10 million people live there because you're essentially using other people's water uh, and then just importing all of the, all of the food. So, you know, th there is a, a solution, but it's a solution that, and it can be sustainable, by the way. I mean, it's not, it's not intrinsically unsustainable. It's unsustainable socially, economically, but it's not, you know, environmentally necessarily unsustainable. But there is this kind of third dimension of having the capacity to muster the resources, the collective resources, to solve the problem you face. And and societies get unhinged from that environment and move when that stock of institutional and human capital is missing. And so the. You know, the East African example is a great one. I worked for many years in southern Ethiopia at the boundary, you know, in Oromia and at the boundary with Kenya. And there you still have pastoralist uh, tribes who are extremely vulnerable to, um, to changes in water, actually both floods and droughts, and they will move very, very quickly. So, you know, I think in a way move the, you know, the, it, it is an index of institutional vulnerability. Uh, the other thing that might happen, by the way, is if you have that institutional scarcity, is conflict. Water doesn't le necessarily lead to conflict. In fact, it more frequently leads to cooperation unless societies don't have the institutions to negotiate with each other. If they don't, as in the case of the border with Kenya and Ethiopia, then you end up in conflict over scarce resources. So I think those, those three dimensions that matter a great deal. And so mapping power is as important as mapping people and mapping water.
Very true. So, I mean, there's that phrase, by the way, about, you know, whenever someone says water wars, you could point out that water wars don't create more water. Um, so, <laughs> exactly. As you say, very often it is a cause for <laughs> diplomatic, you know, efforts to produce, you know, sort of co joint conservation areas. And obviously, uh, you know, I mean, I guess the outcome is different in each part of the world where you have tension over water. Obviously, the Egypt Sudan, uh, you know, Ethiopia situation is different from the Mekong River situation and so forth. But on yeah. the institutions, I mean, it leads to another question, though, because this idea of extended urbanization, you know, or planetary urbanization, as it's known, which is the phenomenon you're referring to, right? People can be in Dubai, but you're basically importing water by way of importing food. But that obviously has very uh, you know, negative effects on greenhouse gas emissions and agricultural supply chains being so long. So yeah. many advocate that we return to this so-called you know, e-couplist, right? Um, you know, this notion that we, we try to produce as much food locally and, and obviously generate our, our fuel locally as well through alternative and renewable sources. So yes, we can stay where we are. The population of Dubai can grow and grow. But that has, and even if that's quote unquote sustainable, as you say, from a socio, social and economic standpoint and a political standpoint, because they have the wealth to finance it, that doesn't make it sustainable uh, environmentally unless they change uh, their yeah. practices. So I yeah. still wonder whether, you know, we'd be better off having, you know, populations, you know, uh, concentrated in areas where they can actually produce their own, you know, obviously, you know, the sort of food, energy, water nexus can be in a tighter geographic radius. Well, yes. And, and so this, you know, in a way is, um, is kind of the issue. And it also leads me to, to a question for you, because on the one hand, you know, we, we have this um, kind of uh, very well honed system for trading goods and services. Uh, a system that, by the way, has existed for a long time. I mean, we had integrated regional systems in the Bronze Age. We had integrated regional systems, you know, all through the Roman period. So this is not new, where we sort of move right. crops around and we're able to keep people fixed because we can move what they need from one place to another. And as a result, the international institutions architecture designed to help states negotiate uh, these trades is actually quite sophisticated. Uh, now, if you were to... Um, and now you might argue that the, the end result is an unsustainable one. And in a way, that critique is ultimately a critique of that globalized, integrated uh, system. So then you flip to this question of could people move instead, right? Rather than moving goods, you start readjusting the distribution of people. And then the question becomes, and I, I wonder whether you sort of, you know, what reflection you have on that is what, in, what institutional architecture, international institutional architecture would you need? Because it strikes me that the the sort of institutions that we have to deal with movement of people are quite a bit less sophisticated and, and quite a bit less honed than those that we have paradoxically to move goods around. Right. Uh, maybe it's not paradoxical at all in the sense that uh, this is something that I address, you know, very directly because in, we have hopes that we could have a global migration accord, a global migration compact, or whatever the case may be. But I, I dare say, on a pessimistic note here, that it's the one thing that we will never have any supranational governance over. I believe that the, the governments of the world will agree on the protocols for colonizing the moon before they will agree on a common international mobility accord or agreement. In fact, it could, be, it could be that the very last vestige of sovereignty that remains is the control over one's borders against the flow of people. Because we don't prevent the flow of goods, per se. Global tariffs have been reduced by 98% over the past century. We can't prevent pathogens or cyber hacks or air pollution from crossing borders. It's the only thing left of sovereignty. And it's what states are designed to do practically in the physical sense of the bordered territorial sovereign state. So it's unfortunate that the movement of people is perhaps the best way to rectify the misalignments between the geography of people and the geography of resources and the geography of infrastructure and economics. But that one layer of geography borders gets in the way of that. And it literally always will. The best we can hope for is bilateral kinds of you know geographic swaps demographic swaps 
which is a you know fancy way of saying countries that absorb lots of migrants. So Canada is one, Britain, America, Germany, eventually Russia, uh, Japan, and so forth. The so-called climate oases of the future are gradually opening up significantly to mass migration. Um, you know, not because of climate change, much more because of their own demographics, because the Northern Hemisphere, OECD countries are aging so rapidly. Um, but climate migration in this century uh, does outnumber you know, political or economic migration. So there's no question that countries have to get more prepared for it. It's just that they won't co- prepare for it collectively. Uh, and right. I think that's, that's obviously very, very unfortunate. Yeah, which then, of course, means that, you know, in this world in which boundaries have sort of this moral value that prevents, you know, that becomes, they're not porous, <clears throat> then in order to accommodate those um, those bilateral migrations, in order to then maintain that, you know, legitimacy, I suspect governments will have to exercise another part of their sovereignty ever more, which is their uh, their um, power over the landscape. I mean, you know, the alternative every state is put in a world of climate change, then you'll have to modify your landscape ever more in order to accommodate uh, a rapidly changing hydrology. And, you know, we see this even in the recent Biden infrastructural plan. Uh, you know, if you think about it, that's a massive investment in what the landscape looks like, in what America actually ends up looking like, what the landscape looks like, what the rural areas look like. And, uh, you know, we had gotten used, I think a lot of people have gotten used to thinking that we uh, will all live in cities and our reality is confined to the urban space and everything that happens out there is, you know, the domain of 22% of the population. And in fact, uh, you know, that's the instrument of security in a world in which people don't move out of your country. I definitely think that the US and other countries that are quote unquote turning inward and now investing more in industrial policy and infrastructure, hopefully will do so in a way that that thinks about climate change first and foremost as a driver of the geographies that should be better cultivated or hab- or, or inhabited and directing resources there first and foremost. And it's a controversial point that I've been making recently, but it's also a practical one. Um, But isn't there, um, in terms of exercising one's sovereignty over one's own resources, even for countries that are not necessarily, you know, as radical or progressive in emissions cuts and other kinds of things, isn't there good evidence that they are now working more and more around bioconservation areas and so forth? And I, I um, you know, I'm alluding to phenomena like the role of the um, WWF or the IUCN in helping countries to designate protected wetland areas and all other kinds of, again, natural conservation tools. Are you noticing that even countries, maybe maybe Brazil is worth exploring and I'd love your view, you know, or, or you know, kind of your, your insight to what's happening there. Are some of the most vulnerable but strategically important ecological, you know, national ecological zones actually under the, you know, see either either under the radar or explicitly um, calling out for help and for support and for investment to preserve those ecosystems that are so important for their for their economies. Well, yes, it's um, it's an ambiguous story at best right now. I think uh, you know the uh, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of attempts at integrating nature in the sort of story of sustainability. Of course, nature means lots of things to different people, and it's a flag under which you can cover and hide a lot of sins, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm quite ambivalent about whether we are actually making any progress there. And certainly rhetorically, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a source of political energy, and so it's a mobilizing, uh, you know, it's a mobilizing theme and, and inevitably becomes a, you know, political theme, but whether practically we are actually making a significant difference to scientifically defined uh, areas of biodiversity, I'm less convinced. And in fact, I fear that, um, you know, the green mantle of environmentalism is becoming a cover <laughs> for a lot of other sins. And this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, you know, uh, there's, I'm from Italy, there's a, there's a mountain in Italy where there's a large, uh, 
kind of um, uh, uh, writing on a side of mounting that says, spells out Dux, D-U-X, because Mussolini yeah. had it inscribed in the forest as he set up his uh, forestry core that was supposed to renew the landscape of the, of, the, yeah. of, of the country. So I have a bit of an instinctive distrust of environmentalism that sort of siloed from any other right. consideration of social and, and economic uh, justice. And I fear that that's a bit what's happening. Biodiversity becomes the excuse for uh, acts of sovereignty on the environment, but not necessarily acts of justice towards, you know, for example, the indigenous people that live there and uh, or, yeah. or those that are disenfranchised in the rural landscape. Wow, so many great questions. Um, a quick question for you guys both is, we just came out, of course, COP26, the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow. Um, we're talking about some really profound pieces of the puzzle that popped up here and there at COP, but I would say, you know, migration was definitely an issue, but not to the level of gravity that, that Parag, that you're articulating. Water, finally on stage, but not, of course, uh, to the water folks getting its full due. On the road to COP27, when we see, we're going to see more changes, we see more commitments. Um, what do you think should be the core message if we, you know, if we take the move meets water um, uh, approach, you know, controversy versus practicality versus, um, you know, political uh, buy-in? Well, I guess, I mean, for me, it's a very easy one because finally climate adaptation rather than just mitigation also came up on the agenda very strongly. And by the end of COP26, the statements were saying that, you know, half of future climate finance should be, you know, be devoted to adaptation. And that's definitely the tune that, that I've been singing. You know, I obviously believe that we need the Manhattan projects, you know, and, and scale when it comes to decarbonization of industry and so forth. But adaptation is a priority for yesterday, for today, for tomorrow. It's here and now. There's immense suffering, and we're not investing nearly enough in helping vulnerable populations adapt. That's just an open and shut fact. So I would like to see a lot more, you know, uh, capital committed to that. And I think that climate adaptation, you know, is is now going to be spoken about, and and a lot more, you know, sort of thinking will go into the the categories of interventions that constitute uh, uh, adaptation. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, although I do think that there's a bit of a divergence between the uh, the sort of political agenda that gets illustrated through the debates that are all around COP and then the actual technical negotiations that end up enshrining, um, you know, progress into the treaties. Uh, I, I do think that there's this growing awareness, Park is right, on, on adaptation. And it's an important, uh, it's an important development politically. I don't know that the UNFCCC is the right framework through which to effect anything particularly meaningful. I mean, the failure to yet again deliver on this promise of $100 billion uh, is, is an indication that, you know, the facts don't fo follow the words. And I think if we are right in, in the discussion that we just had about the fact that ultimately adaptation is this kind of blend of different acts of sovereignty that have to do in part with accommodating movement, in part with exercising sovereignty in the landscape, that's power that individual states are unlikely to want to give up very easily to international treaties. Uh, and so the interesting question will be in and around the COP process, not necessarily just COP27, but around the sort of decadal process, what kind of uh, deals will be struck uh, uh, you know, uh, bilaterally or multilaterally, regionally, you know, for example, you know, between now and the next decade, Europe will have to figure out a way of dealing with migration across the Mediterranean. And some of that is actually very tightly linked to uh, water distribution, you know, as, as, uh, as I'm sure you both uh, have said many times. So, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that the topics come up, less convinced that the UNFCCC COP process is the one where we're going to find resolution. Okay, and, and Parag, any last uh, any last thoughts here from both you guys? Um, you know, we're talking again profound uh, profound projections um, based on based on history um, and based on maps into the future, based on scenarios. Um, what should we be looking Only for? Only that we, we, we are moving in the, in the right direction, you know, intellectually. Um, you know, we are, we're accepting that water is destiny and mobility is destiny. Let's put it that way. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, the one thing I'll say, um, uh, Carl, is that both Parag's work and, and, and the book I wrote reflect the fact that there's, at least in those of us who are sort of half practitioners and live in this world of the boundaries between policy and business, and there's the, the recognition that geography matters, that uh, distribution in space and time of resources and people matter a great deal. And I would observe that, you know, the sort of centers of intellectual production, academia and the likes are behind here. You know, we don't, macroeconomic models reflect neither of our sort of uh, uh, thoughts around the geographical distribution of, uh, uh, of, of resources, for example. So I think that the next 10 years, if we are right, the next 10 years will have to also see a significant evolution, at least, uh, in some of the instruments that academia and sort of the, the sort of policy analysts are using to, to understand the world. Because we're still in a world where, you know, business thinks that things can be sourced anywhere without necessarily having any knowledge about the context in which they're sourced, right? And that has to change if we're right. Wow. Well, two books on the front lines of that. Uh, Giulio Boccoletti, author of Water, a bi biography, and Parag Khanna, author of Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. So thanks, you, uh, thanks to you both for joining us for really this edition of Speaking of Water from Circle of Blue. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. It was great. <laughs>